morning! Today I am taking you on a literary walk across Haworth Moor. So why is this going to be so special? Well this is where the Bronte sisters lived their short but fruitful lives. The Bronte family are one of the most iconic literary families in the world and I'm currently on the main street in Haworth. The Brontes moved here in 1820 so it looks rather different than what it would have done back then and the village itself is very high up and there's not too much elevation at the beginning of this walk but I will be heading over into the moors so there'll be a bit of a climb up there because I plan to go up to the areas in which the Bronte sisters took their many walks. Haworth is in the Worth Valley amid the Pennines, West Yorkshire, England. The nearest city is Bradford which is nine miles away. Walking down the main street here feels like going back in time with all the cobbled streets and quirky buildings. Haworth's also getting a name for itself as a haven for independent businesses, from luxurious handmade chocolates to art galleries, and then an array of places to eat and drink. It may also surprise you to know that Haworth became the world's first fair trade village in 2002. Throughout Bronte country, they are passionate about fair trade, with Keithley and Thornton also being awarded fair trade status. Haworth is even now twinned with Machu Picchu. This Pennine village where the Bronte sisters grew up it used to be a very busy industrial village and the death rate was as high as Bradford and London. 41% of children used to die before the age of six and the average death rate was 24 years old. There are plenty of pubs and hotels here in Howard, and behind me you can see the Black Bull. This is where Branwell Bronte's decline into alcoholism and opium addiction apparently started. I don't know if it did or not, but he certainly frequented here quite a lot. I'm heading to Haworth Parsonage now, which is now the Bronte Parsonage Museum. It was home to the Brontes from 1820 to 1861. And all you do is you go to the top of the main street and turn left. This is the old schoolroom in Haworth. This was built for the children of Haworth. Charlotte, Branwell, Emily and Anne were all taught here. It's also the site of Charlotte's wedding reception in 1854. And here we are coming up to the Bronte Parsonage. Unfortunately, it will be closed all day today due to the current lockdown situation still here in England. But this is a view of me standing on a wall with my arms in the air. <laughs> The Brontes are the authors of some best loved books in the English literature and it's incredible to be standing right outside their home where they wrote these books. We have Charlotte with Jane Eyre, Emily with Wuthering Heights and Anne with The Tenant of Wildfell Hall, all written here 1847 and 1848 and that's over 150 years ago. It's a shame we can't go in today and show you around, but you will have to come along and check it out for yourself at some point. It contains furniture and other artifacts used by the family. To find two writers of genius in one family is very rare, but to find so many writers in one household is unique in the history of literature. Charlotte and Emily are ranked among the world's greatest novelists. Anne is a powerful, underrated author, and both her father, the Reverend Patrick Bronte, and her brother, Branwell, also saw their own works in print. The Brontes, published under the pseudonyms of Cura, Ellis and Acton Bell, were acknowledged at the time for their directness and powerful emotional energy, qualities which were sometimes interpreted by the critics as coarse and brutal. Just before you get to the parsonage is St Michael's and All Angels Church, which I am in front of now. It has been rebuilt since their time, although the tower is original, but it does contain the Bronte family vault. So the church is here behind me, and at this side is the parsonage over there. 
All the Brontes are buried here, except for Anne. She's buried in St Mary's Church in Scarborough. This is the third building of religious significance to stand on this site, with the first Howarth Chapel dating back to the 14th and 15th centuries. In 1879, it was decided to take down the old church building and build a new one. This caused a national outcry, as Howarth and the church had already become a place of Bronte pilgrimage. However, it was proved that the building was unsafe and unsanitary, as water from that graveyard was seeping in through the floor, so the work went ahead. The church is well visited by tourists eager to see the Bronte Memorial Chapel in the church and the Bronte family tomb. In 1964, the Bronte Memorial Chapel was dedicated by the Bishop of Bradford. The communion table, chandelier and the Bronte Memorial tablet are from the Bronte Church before it was rebuilt. It's estimated there is around about 42,000 burials here in this graveyard. Most of them are families and usually in graveyards, I think it's usually three people in one grave spot. But here, I think it goes into double figures. Many of the graves from the time of the Bronte family hold entire families, including a number of infants. Because of the overcrowding, the graveyard closed in 1883, with a new cemetery opening in 1893, just off the road to Stanbury. There is some incredible gravestones here in the cemetery. I mean, look at the detail on this here. It truly is incredible. If you walk up through the graveyard, you do get a better picture of the parsonage, which is up here. And I'm gonna go and show you Tabitha's grave. This is Tabitha Eichroyd's grave and she is the long-standing servant of the Bronte family. They called her Tabby and she was very much part of the family. Charlotte wrote about her in letters quite often about her broad Howarth accent and old-fashioned ways. And she moved in after about three years after their mother's death. The children were being looked after, <laughs> church bells going, the children were being looked after by their mother's sister Elizabeth. But I think Tabitha took over that role. And even though the girls did a lot of their own washing and cooking and cleaning, Tabitha for the first 15 years of living here was the only cook and servant here in the house. They used to go on lots of walks across the moors. I don't know why, but there is something special about this grave. And I know a lot of people come here to see the Brontes tombs and the history. But Tabitha, I mean, the girls obviously loved her so much because she fell and broke her leg on High Street in Howarth on some ice. And they didn't want her to go and have care anywhere else. They wanted to look after her. So they literally looked after her for nearly three years. It took her a long time to heal, but they took over the responsibility of running the house and cared for her just like they would a mother. Now she lived to a ripe old age of over 85 and they think that she perhaps died of typhoid which I think is what one of the other girls died of. Outside the church you come across these stocks where offenders back in the day were locked in them as punishment. I'm just walking through Parsons Field up to a stone which is part of the Bronte Stone Project. 
This is a meadow behind the parsonage and I shall show you the stone and explain a little bit more about the project when I get there. This final stone was installed here for the Bronte Stones project which launched to international acclaim in 2018. The Bronte Stones are a group of stones placed in the landscape between the birthplace of the Bronte family in Thornton and the parsonage where they wrote their famous work in Haworth. The project was devised by writer Michael Stewart who took inspiration from other literary walks. There are three stones that celebrate the bicenturies of the three sisters, Charlotte, Emily and Anne, and a fourth stone to mark the significance of the Brontes as a literary family. It features new works by four of the most inspirational writers of our time, Kate Bush, Carol Ann Duffy, Jeanette Winterson and Jackie Kay. I have just been walking up here and I've been in Penistone Hill Country Park a number of times and I have never noticed these stones and when you look closely you think they're just stones at first but they're actually books obviously Bronte related that is so cool I've never seen them before I like that that's quirky Now that is a bench asking to be sat on. Perfect little breakfast stop. Penistone Hill Country Park is to the west of Haworth, about a third of a mile, and it's a space of open moorland. There are three quarries here, West End, Dimples and Penistone, where they used to quarry sandstone to build the neighbouring houses. They also used to use it for the neighbouring reservoirs and roads. However, quarrying ceased in the late 1960s. Behind me, you can see what looks like a small pond. These small ponds, known as fourth ponds, and lumps of sandstone were used to drain the moorland when it used to be mined for coal. The coal was of poor quality, so when the Keithley and Worth Valley Railway arrived, better quality coal was transported in to supply the local mills. Now this seems to be a reoccurring theme in my videos. <laughs> you can't be a good trig point. This one is at the highest point of the hill and is at 1,030 feet. It is believed that Penistone Hill derives its name from the gambling game, Game Penny Stone, and it's also known that men would gather on Penistone Hill for this. I don't know if anybody has seen the drama To Walk Invisible about the Brontes. Well, this was filmed here in March 2016, so the BBC could film exterior shots of the parsonage. They actually built a whole replica of the house up here on the park itself. Oh, look what I've found in the heather. There's all these little blueberries or bilberries. Wow, I didn't know they had these up here.
I have just left the country park and now going to head towards the waterfalls and up to Top Withens. But I wanted to stop and show you this sign. Can you see the writing up here? Well, Haworth is one of the first tourist attractions to signpost in Japanese because it's very popular among the Japanese tourists. I don't know if you can see this, but Top Withens is all the way, let me zoom in, up here, all the way up there where that little tree is on the horizon. I'm at Bronte Waterfall, which is not too much of a cascade of water. There's some small stepped falls over gritstone rocks here, which gives it that lovely kind of relaxed feeling. It's too, not too much of a gushing waterfall, but it's a beautiful place to come and have a look. It can get quite muddy when it's been raining, so definitely wear sensible shoes or come when it's not been raining too badly. I'm also going to head over to Bronte Bridge and show you that as well as Bronte Chair, which is where apparently the sisters sat and started writing their first novels. It is quite busy today and there's a lot of children playing in the area, so I might have to be a little bit careful with filming, but I'll show you what I can for sure. This is Bronte Bridge. It was destroyed in 1989 May, but rebuilt in 1990. Me and a puddle had a falling out. The muddy puddle won. Another popular walk that the Bronte sisters enjoyed was up to Top Withens, which is where I am heading now. You should still be able to see it behind me. It's still up there. I'm still making my way up. And this is apparently where Wuthering Heights is based on. 
This is written by Emily Bronte and it includes the stories of the Earnshaw family and it is a lovely place to come and hike and get away from it all. I'll stop here because there's some water in front of me and it is a beautiful place because you just see all the moorland. I've been up here a couple of times before and you just get to look around you. It's like a really high point and you, the moors look different every single time I come. And you can see why so many pilgrims come every year and it's just a lovely area and I can't believe how quiet it is today. I had to read this while at Top Withens. Wuthering Heights was published in 1848 and one reviewer actually wrote this. The reader is shocked, disgusted, almost sickened by details of cruelty, inhumanity and the most diabolical hate and vengeance. And anon come passages of powerful testimony to the supreme power of love, even over demons in the human form. It was one of the most astonishing reviews in English literature. Nothing has ever been written like it since. I have just arrived at a place called Alcomden Stones, which is about half a mile west of Top Withens. It's a large rocky outcrop area, as you can see. And back in the 19th century, it's thought to be a place of Druid sacrifice because there's what looks to be a very large stone altar here. But in fact, it, it wasn't. It wasn't anything quite as exciting as that. It was all to do with the glacial movement back in the last ice age. There are some stunning panoramic views across the moor here and into Lancashire. The ground's often very wet and the trail isn't always obvious, but it is a lovely place to stop, contemplate and appreciate nature.
I've found a little bit of shelter from the wind and I thought this would be a perfect place to stop and have some lunch. And I nearly forgot to film it. I normally go ahead and just start eating. But I know people are always usually quite interested in what I have on these walks. So let me show you what I've got today. This is a quinoa salad that I made yesterday and it's got chickpeas, kale, sun-dried tomatoes. It has got spring onions, carrots and a homemade dressing. I think this section has got to be my favourite part of the walk so far. There is just something about being in the middle of nowhere when there's no people around and you've just got, oh, I just absolutely love it. I mean, it's so special walking through Howarth, don't get me wrong, and seeing top withens and the parsonage and everywhere like that. But walking through the mud, <laughs> going through all the boggy sections, Oh, I just love it. I just love being out in more of the, the wild roaming area, which is why I've chosen to do this little bit of extension on this walk today, rather than just doing the typical sites. Now, a lot of Yorkshire people like to think of the Brontes as true Yorkshire folk, but in fact, they're Celtic by birth. Patrick Bronte was born on the 17th of March, 1777 in County Down. He was the first of 10 children and he married Maria and she was from Cornish descent. And they moved to Haworth in 1820 with their six children and they stayed there for the rest of their lives. I am now walking up to Pond and Kirk, which is a large outcrop of gritstone rocks that jut out on the hillside here. Apparently they're supposed to have magical properties and local legend says that if a young girl climbs through the hole at the base of the rocks, they're supposed to marry within the year. It's quite windy up here, but Pond and Kirk is supposed to be the inspiration for Penstone Crags and the Fairy Cave, which is mentioned in Emily Bronte's Wuthering Heights.
am nearing the end of my walk today around Howarth and the Bronte country, which is unfortunate because it's been such a lovely day and the weather has been so nice. I've walked probably around about 10 miles. I'll put the exact route down below in the description if you want to check it out. But one thing to bear in mind, if the weather's nice, you will not be on your own because it is quite a popular route. Now, I was hoping to have a bit of rain, bleak weather, a bit of mist, dark and moody setting, because I kind of wanted that feeling of what Cathy would have felt on her liaisons with Heathcliff in the moors. But I got sunshine, only in Britain. <laughs> when you don't want it, you get it. But it has just been so wonderful today, and I hope you've enjoyed coming along with me today. And I will look forward to seeing you next time. Goodbye. Mm -hmm.